Insightful Teaching with Jacob Prash on Moriel TV, where God is my teacher. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. Thank you so much for joining us. Tonight is, of course, an experiment to see if there's any possibility, viably, of doing a Zoom Bible study, perhaps on a weekly basis. The problem, of course, is that people in Australia, New Zealand, places like that won't be able to join us. And it's not what these people in North America can join us. I'm situated in Britain. I'm a little bit flexible, but I don't think we can cover the whole planet too easily. It's already getting late in South Africa. It's, it's late. Getting late in Israel and so forth. I just don't know if this is going to work, but we'll give it our best shot. Turn with me, please, to the Gospel of St. John, chapter 5. After these things, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, a pool, which is called in Hebrew, Bethesda, which means House of Grace, having five porticos. In these lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered, waiting for the moving of the waters, for an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever then, first after the stirring of the waters, stepped in, was made well from whatever disease with which he was afflicted. A man was there who had been ill for 38 years, and when Jesus saw him lying there and knew he had already been there a long time in that condition, he said, Do you wish to get well? And the sick man answered, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your pallet, and walk. And immediately the man became well and picked up his pallet and began to walk. First of all, we have a considerable amount of archaeological knowledge. I've been to the Pool of Bethesda many times. Some of you have. But also we have historical references from the Mishnah and especially from Josephus, that this was next to or adjacent the Sheep Gate. Later church fathers said it was the Sheep Pool, but the original idea was that it was situated north of the Temple Antonia, was where it is. Um, today it's called the Church of St. Anne. It's run by Canadian Catholics, Catholic Church from Canada, from Quebec. But it's well excavated, very well excavated, and the excavations very much confirm what the New Testament tells us. The excavations confirm the New Testament accounts. It is close today, not to the Sheep Gate, but to what's called St. Stephen's Gate or the Lion Gate, built by Suleiman the Magnificent, close to where the Sheep Gate had been during the Turkish Ottoman period. Now, this gate also became very famous in 1967. It's where the Selchanim, the Israeli paratroopers, came through that gate and liberated the old city from the Jordanians. Uh, battle with high consequences and many casualties. But because it was adjacent to the Temple Mount on the left, the Muslims were afraid of the Mosque of Omar and the Mosque of Aqsa, that is the Dome of the Rock, being destroyed. So they stopped fighting. They stopped fighting, even though there were heavy casualties getting through the gate. This is a blood-soaked area in history. Fortress Antonio, it's also close to the Lithosistras. Um, the place where the circle game was played with the dice where they gambled for Jesus' clothes. Um, the present stones may be from the first century or the second century from the 10th Roman Legion, but it's a small area loaded, loaded with biblical history. Now, we cannot make a doctrine from typology. Nonetheless, there, is, there are typological elements in the text that it's crucial that we understand. It's crucial that we understand. Let's begin looking at that it was a feast of the Jews. It was a feast of the Jews. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. We have certain pilgrim feasts where you have to celebrate them in Jerusalem if you were able. These would be Pentecost, Hag Shavuot. 
it would certainly be uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, Hag Sukkot. But the question is, which one is this? Which one is this? Uh, Passover being another one, if you could do it. But which one was this? In John chapters 9 and 10, particularly chapter 10, we also see Jesus in Jerusalem for Hanukkah. So because it took place, the text, the story, the narrative takes place in Jerusalem, does not necessarily prove it had to be a pilgrim feast. It may have. People have speculated it could be the Feast of Purim, the Feast of Purim. And they did this because they were looking, based on the astronomical tables, of when a Shabbos would have been 32, 33 AD, 32 AD, and they reckon by some calculations it could be the Feast of Esther, the Feast of Purim. But there's nothing in the typology or in the narrative connecting it with the Feast of Purim. If the feast is stated, there must be some reason. What feast is it? Now let's look at the narrative in itself. The narrative in itself. The man was by the pool trying to get rid of his sin. Trying to get rid of his sin. That's what he was trying to do. We only have very broad references to healing waters in the Dead Sea Scrolls from the Essenes and in the Mishnah, but there's nothing that we have recorded from Josephus or anywhere else that gives any extra biblical account of a stirring of the waters. In fact, the earliest manuscripts don't even have the stirring of the waters in the text. It is only because of verse 7 that we know that the waters had to move. The man said, I have no one to put me in when the water is stirred up. Hence, the rest could be a interpolation at a later point. But we know that the water had to move, and we know that there were two main pools, and you can see them today. The water moving from one pool to the other is what would have caused the motion of the waters. Uh, there'd be a natural explanation. But, and there's also aquifers nearby um, coming off from the Kidron and the, the pool of the uh, brook of the Kidron. But we know this that there'd be a motion of the water and there was a, a hospital there of some sort. Now, Jesus comes there at a holy day. The man is trying to get rid of his sin at a place of water. So we have water trying to get rid of sin at a place of water. And it is a holy day. What holy day could it be? What in the text gives us a solid indication beyond speculation? And there have been many speculations. We need something more definite and more solid to know what this day is. John is the most festal of the Gospels. It is the Gospel that most shows Jesus as the messianic fulfillment of the Hebrew holy days. As most of you know, he primarily fulfills the autumn holy days in his second coming. He only partially fulfills those in his first coming. In his first coming, he fulfills the autumn holy days enough to prove he's the Messiah because the Messiah had to fulfill the Torah. You have a partial fulfillment. I'll come to that in a moment. But the primary fulfillment of the spring holy days takes place in his first coming. So Jesus primarily fulfills the spring holy days. That is Passover. Um, that is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That is Pentecost in his first coming. Okay, In his second coming, it is more concerned with, obviously, Yom Teruah, which today is called Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, but that's not what it is in Scripture, the Feast of uh, Trumpets. And then the Days of Awe, followed by Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and then the Feast of Tabernacles. So Jesus fulfills the spring holy days in his first coming, but the autumn ones in his second. 
John is the most keen to show Jesus fulfilling these holy days. It's in the other Gospels, but it's focal to John, and particularly when they're celebrated in Jerusalem. Even Hanukkah is celebrated in Jerusalem, which is not one of the original holy days from uh, the book of Leviticus chapter 23. Purim and Hanukkah were added later from the book of Ruth and from the prophecies of Daniel and the historical fulfillment of those prophecies with the Maccabees. So the spring holy days in his first coming, the autumn holy days in his second, although there had to be a partial fulfillment of the autumn holy days. One example, Zechariah 14 tells us that when Jesus comes back, the Feast of Tabernacles will have its ultimate fulfillment. The nations will worship the Lord in Jerusalem, according to Zechariah 14, the Messianic Kingdom. As I've pointed out on other teachings, this is the reason at the Transfiguration, Peter wanted to build three booths. He thought, here's Moses, here's Elijah, here's the Messiah. This must be the establishment of the Messianic Kingdom. That is the millennium. So he wanted to build three booths. It was perfectly rational what he wanted to do to his understanding. He thought it was the Feast of Booths, but it was, or, or at least the fulfillment of it, even though it may not have taken place on the Feast of Tabernacles. If it had been on the Feast of Tabernacles, it would have had to take place in Jerusalem because Jesus would have to go to Jerusalem in order to, to celebrate it. So there had to be a partial fulfillment even of the Autumn Holy Days. When we get to John chapter 7, we see Jesus partially fulfilling the prophetic meaning of the Feast of Tabernacles. In the ritual called Simcha Bet Shoiva, when they would pour out the living water on the uh, pavement of the Temple Mount, uh, we have now excavated the very stairs that Jesus would have went up in the ceremonial staircase where the Levites would have taken the water from the pool of Shiloam, Shiloach, which means apostle, where Jesus healed the blind man, take the water in containers and have a procession with singing the songs, psalms of ascent going up to the Temple Mount. And this again, the archaeology verifies the accuracy of John's gospel very acutely. So we see a partial fulfillment of John 7. Why did Jesus have to fulfill the autumn holy days in part? Because it is finished. As the Messiah, he had to fulfill all of the holy days as a witness and testimony to the Jews that he is the Messiah, even though they have a future meaning. Remember, all of these holy days in some way have a future meaning. Passover is a picture of the marriage supper of the Lamb, isn't it? At the Paschal Seder, let me sit at your right and at your left. Jesus said, I long to eat the Passover with you, but we will not do it until I do it in the kingdom of my Father. Passover has a future meaning. As we just mentioned, tabernacles has a future meaning. All of these things. Joel chapter 2 has a future meaning. It was only partially fulfilled in his first coming on the uh, day of Pentecost. But there was no fire and smoke. There was no darkening of the sun and moon, those things still have to happen in the book of Revelation. So there's always a dual fulfillment, a dual meaning of these holy days. A partial fulfillment uh, and a primary fulfillment. The primary fulfillment is in his first coming, but it has a future meaning. But the autumn holy days are a bit different. Their main fulfillment will be in his return. I hope that's clear. Uh, you can ask at the question time to have it re-explained if it isn't. But let's look now at this uh, carefully. The man is trying to get rid of his sin at the place of the water. Look with me, please, to the book of Nehemiah, chapter 7. Remember, there's no chapter divisions in the Hebrew canon. And when the seventh month came, which is the month of Tishrei, 
the sons of Israel were in their cities, and all the people gathered as one man at the square which was in front of the water gate. And they asked Ezra the scribe to bring the Torah scroll, which the Lord had given to Israel, which uh, the law of Moses, which was given to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the Torah scroll before the people on the first day of the seventh month. And they read the Torah scroll and they translate it into Aramaic because most of the people did not know Hebrew anymore following the Babylonian captivity. And when the Torah was read, it drove the people into a realization that what had happened to them in Babylon was because of their sin. This takes place at a place of water at the first of Tishrei. Well, what is the first of Tishrei? Today it's called Rosh Hashanah. It is the Feast of Trumpets, okay? Yom Truah. Now, what do Orthodox Jews to this day do at Yom Truah? How do they observe it to this day? They get ready for the days of awe leading up to Yom Kippur, and scripturally, it was not New Year. New Year was the first of Nisan in the spring. The rabbis changed it in the Middle Ages. This was the inauguration of the days of awe, blowing the trumpets for warning. Now again, this has meaning for the time of Jacob's trouble at the close of the age of the blowing of the shofars. But let's look now at this. Um, it has a correspondence to the trumpet judgments in Revelation in part, but let's understand this further now. You have the observance of Rosh Hashanah, as they call it. It's actually Yom Truah in the New Test in the Scriptures. Today we could also call it the Feast of Trumpets, or of, of ram's horns, by a ceremony called the Tashlik, the Tashlik, and they liturgically read from a liturgy called the Machzor. The Machzor is a festal liturgy from the Hebrew Scriptures, from the book of Micah, where it says, I will cast your <clears throat> sins into the sea. So Jews go to the nearest place of water. They go to the nearest place of running water or and, and try to get rid of their sin any place the water is moving that resembles the sea, if they live far from the sea, particularly if it's a tributary that goes into the sea or an estuary. In any event, they go to a place of moving water. Today, they go down to the foot of the Kidron on the other side of Hezekiah's tunnel to the pool of Siloam, where Jesus healed the blind man and told him to go wash in the pool. And you'll see them down there on Rosh Hashanah trying to throw their sins into the water. This is called the Tashlik, the Tashlik. It's observed to this very day, trying to get rid of your sin at the place of the water. Now remember, John preached the baptism of repentance, uh, not of salvation. It was not one of co-death and co-resurrection. It was one of repentance. They were trying desperately to get rid of their sin at the place of the water. So we have this picture now of the Tashlik from the Feast of Trumpets from Rosh Hashanah, and we have the water, and we have it on the Feast of uh, Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of, of Trumpets. It is almost for certain, I'm almost positive, that this holy day in John 5 is Rosh Hashanah, is the Feast of Trumpets, is Yom Truah, because of the Tashlik they're trying to get rid of their sin at the place, he's trying to get rid of their sin at the place of the water, where the water is moved. Now, at, at the appropriate season, it says, this may be a reference to the festal season of, of the Hayamim Anoraim, of the, the days of all, beginning with the Feast of Trumpets. So, I don't agree with those who say that it's 
the Feast of Esther. There's nothing in the text that would blink it thematically or typologically in any way with Esther. But very much there's a case of the Tashlik trying to get rid of your sin into the water at a special feast dedicated to that purpose. The days of awe begin getting ready for Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. You've got to repent of your sins at the place of the water, the washing away of sin. This is the theme. This is what is happening here in John chapter 5. It then continues. The man is there for 38 years. 38 years. 38 is often associated with the longevity or the duration of the reign of wicked kings in books of Chronicles and of Kings. However, in the book of Numbers, it is of the 40 years when the judgment ended. The judgment of God ended after 38 years, we see in the Torah. The judgment of God on Israel ended after 38 years. This is numerical symbolism of the 38. It's the time when God removes the judgment. Uh, they came under judgment with the golden calf. This judgment goes on for 38 years. Okay. Now, at the end of the 38 years, what happens? They go through the water, remember? They go through the water at Gilgal, through the Jordan, and into the promised land. This idea of 38 has something to do with the end of the period of God's judgment in biblical typology and in numerical symbolism. So it's there after 38 years, the Lord is going to show this guy grace. He's going to show this guy grace. Now, been there these 38 years, and <clears throat> there are five porticos, five porticos, that is five entry porches. When the text specifies something <coughs> about the archi architectural surrounding, when it describes the buildings, there's always a reason when it makes reference to buildings and their dimensions and how many there were. You see this in the other discourse with the Herodian stones. Not one will be cast down upon another. Whenever you see a specific mention to the architecture, uh, <clears throat> there's, a, there's a reason. Theologically, doctrinally, there's a reason. Five is always the number of Pentateuch, of Pentateuch. In the Old Testament, you have the five books of Moses, the Torah, okay? The New Testament equivalent Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the sequel to Luke is Acts, okay? Deuteronomy is likewise a sequel. Deuteronomion in Greek, it's the second telling of the law. So you have four books, and then you have a sequel. In the Torah, it's the same. You have Breshit, Genesis. You have Shemot, Exodus. Ve'yikra, you have the Leviticus. Bar numbers, and then you have Dvarim, Deuteronomy. It's five, it's five. The old covenant is built on five books. The new covenant is built on five books. What the prophets did in the law and the prophets was point people back to the Torah or explain the meaning of the Torah. So too, with the New Testament, the epistles explain the meaning of the gospel. They explain the meaning of Jesus' teaching. Jesus told the apostles, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will remind you of all I have taught you. The Holy Spirit inspired the Hebrew prophets to explain the teaching of Moses because in the New Covenant, the Holy Spirit inspired the apostles to explain the teaching of Jesus. So you always have this five, five entry porches, five ways into the water that removes the sin next to the sheep gate, to the house of grace, Beth Hezda, five. Again, we don't base a doctrine on the type. 
We simply say the typology illustrates the doctrine. That is the reason. The five ways in, the five paths of entry into forgiveness of sin. Remember what Paul said. The law, the Torah, is our tutor. It teaches us about our need for salvation and that we can't save ourselves. We need the Messiah to save us. So this man becomes what theologians would call a corporate solidarity. He's one person who represents a larger group of people. He represents all of Israel, but he represents also, in a wider sense, the human race. The frustration. You can have the scriptures, you can have the porticos, but only the Lord can save you. A ritual like baptism in itself cannot save you. Now that's very interesting here, because when Jesus came into the life of somebody, like the blind man, when the blind see, he told him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. This man is not told to wash in the pool of Beth Hezda. Not told to wash in the pool of Beth Hezda. He's now met the Lord. That's not the place for him to be or to get baptized. He needs to understand he's now met the Messiah. That is completely different now. It's gone beyond the Torah. The Torah cannot save. The Torah can only teach about the need for salvation. Now let's look at this a bit further. There are three reasons Jesus did healing miracles. Three reasons. The first reason, obviously, is the compassion of God. The compassion of God. There's a verse that tells us that in the Gospels. The compassion of God is one reason Jesus did healing miracles. The second reason is Nesim Veniflaot, signs and wonders. They were emblematic of his messiahship. There were certain miracles they believed only the Messiah could do. Curiously, raising the dead was not one of them because Elijah did that. <laughs> Other people did that. But making the blind see and the deaf hear, they believed only the Messiah could do that. Therefore, when Jesus comes, and this is the background to John 9, he makes a blind person see, a deaf person hear, only the Messiah could do that. Is this the Messiah? Nobody but the Messiah could do this. Well, then we come to the third reason. The first one, again, is just the compassion of God. The second, it is apologia, an apo apology or apologetic proof for his Messiahship. But the third one is that the healing miracles illustrate salvation. We are all blind until we see the light. <laughs> we are all deaf until my sheep hear my voice. We are spiritually blind and spiritually deaf until Jesus opens our eyes and our ears. So too we are all lame. We cannot walk in the spirit until we meet Jesus. So these miracles of healing always illustrate salvation in some way. They always illustrate salvation in some way. So let's put these things together. He's at this pool of Bethesda, the house of grace, but it does him no good. There are five porticos, five porches of entry, and they're all excavated now. The base of them are all excavated, but it doesn't do him any good. At the age, at, after 38 years of this, the judgment ends, and we know this was a judgment for sin, which we'll come to in a moment. The judgment ends after 38 years, the same as it ended with Israel. Again, he's a corporate solidarity. He's one person who's a picture of a larger group of people. So this takes place then, and it takes place at a holy day where the people are looking to get rid of their sin at a place of water. Here, Jesus fulfills the Tashlik, fulfills the ritual of Tashlik that Orthodox Jews liturgically still practice on the Feast of Tabernacles. Let's move forward looking at this further now. 
This goes on. And Jesus tells him, pick up your pallet and walk. Well, as we've pointed out before, if Jesus healed somebody of muscular dystrophy or polio, why would he tell them, pick up your crutches? Or why would he tell a para, a, a quadriplegic or paraplegic to get back into your wheelchair? <laughs> why would he tell someone to pick up your crutches and to keep your wheelchair? It makes no logical sense. However, the pallet, of course, was the piece of wood to which his flesh was confined. He was confined to a piece of wood. He was physically, or his flesh, was confined to a piece of wood. Now it was the Sabbath day. So the Jews were saying to the man who was cured, it's the Sabbath, and it's not permissible for you to carry your pallet. This is a whole major issue in itself, almost an absurd one. At the time of Jesus, although this was written later, we know from the oral law, when it was later written, that Rabbi Yochanan, quoting Rabbi Shimon ben Yechai, said, if all Israel kept the Sabbath twice in a row perfectly, every Jew, that the redemption would come, that the redemption would come immediately. The Messianic redemption would come if every Jew kept the Sabbath for two Sabbaths in a row. They were meticulous about keeping the Sabbath. The Sabbath violation was one of the sins to which they attributed the Babylonian captivity when they lost the throne of David and the Davidic lineage that they were waiting for the Messiah to restore. According to the Mishnah, there were 72 classes of work. These derived from 32 other classes of work that the rabbis determined from the various skills you needed to build the Ark of the Covenant. But by the time of Jesus, the rabbis had expanded this to 72 classes of work. And if you did it on the Sabbath, woe to you. Now, the utter hypocrisy of this, they would pull a cow out of a ditch on the Sabbath. <laughs> but to heal a blind man on the Sabbath or a lame man on the Sabbath, that was seen as a violation of the Sabbath. This relates to what Jesus said. The Sabbath was made for man. Man was not made for the Sabbath. They deify the day. Orthodox Jews, to this day, they deify, they worship the day, as if the day was somehow divine. Now what they have hold of is a half-truth, a half-truth. In a synagogue, they actually turn around, face the entrance in the back of the synagogue, and they greet the Sabbath like a bride. It's all kinds of things. However, we read in the New Testament, Jesus, who is God made man, Jesus is our Sabbath rest. Yeah, the Sabbath is divine because it's the Messiah. We enter into his Sabbath rest. We do not strive in our own strength or our own flesh. We enter into his rest. He did it for us. Our actions are a result of having been saved, not an attempt to get saved. Our works or because we've been saved. Our works themselves cannot save us. We entered into his Sabbath rest. The Sabbath for a believer is in a person, Jesus, Yeshua. It's not in the day. Understand this in Colossians chapter 2. Um, let no one be your judge about a festival, a new moon, or a Sabbath. You can worship on a Saturday, a Sunday. Uh, Romans 14, who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he will stand or fall. One man esteems one day, one another. Let each be convinced in his own mind. Our Sabbath is in a person. It's not in a day. Now, we have 
legalistic Presbyterians in the Hebrides Islands in Scotland. They're Sabbatarian legalists. They really are. They're as legalistic about it as Orthodox Jews are for a Saturday, only they do it for a Sunday. But then we have the semi-cult, and they're cultic. They believe many false things, the Seventh-day Adventists. Um, they claim that Ellen G. White had an angel appear to her and point out the Ten Commandments and point finger point to the one that shall keep the Sabbath. And the Seventh-day Adventists actually taught that those who worship on Sunday take the mark of the beast and all kinds of other errors derive from this teaching. They say the two witnesses in Revelation are the Old and New Testament and various things. They also believe in soul sleep. They don't believe we go to be in the conscience presence of the Lord when we give up the ghost. Nonetheless, the fundamental error was the error of Ellen G. White. She does the very thing with the Sabbatarian legalism that the text of Colossians 2 says not to do taking your stand on the vision of angels, taking your stand on the vision of angels. Now, the rabbis made a big deal in John 5 about Jesus healing this guy on a Sabbath. They were obsessed with the day instead of with its meaning. Look with me, please, to the book of Colossians chapter 2. It's a very important chapter if you're going to share your faith with a, or try to correct the error of a um, Seventh-day Adventist, or if you're talking to a Sabbatarian legalist of any kind. And we're told, see to it that no one, uh, in verse 8, takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, other than according to Christ. For in him, the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form. In other words, Jesus was fully human and fully divine, an important Christological statement. And in him, you have been made complete. Our completion is in him, not in a day. He's the head over an all rule and authority. In other words, He's called elsewhere in the New Testament the Lord of the Sabbath. He's called the Lord of the Sabbath. Now, I'll just skip down to verse 16, please, of Colossians 2. Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink, that is, eating kosher and so forth, or in respect to a festival, a new moon, or a Sabbath day. These things are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to the Messiah. These Old Testament elements are types, are shadows that were put there by God to teach the Jews how to recognize the Messiah when he came. They were there to teach to recognize him. That's what they were there for. Once he comes, they are fulfilled, like the hand on the wall makes a shadow. But once the hand comes, you don't need the shadow anymore to know anything about the hand. Now you have the substance. The shadow will teach you about the hand and help you to identify the hand when it shows up. But once the hand actually shows up, you no longer need the shadow. Jews may observe it for cultural reasons, even Jewish believers, but that's something different. We cannot be legalistic about these things in any kind of a mandatory sense or, or no meanistic about observance of these things. It's a matter of personal choice, culture, and conscience. But look what it says further. Let no one, again, the, the Sabbath is a shadow of the Messiah. Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of angels taking his stand on the visions he has seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind. Notice people building doctrine on claimed angelic revelation. 
This is the lie upon which Islam is built. The claim that Gabriel appeared to Mohammed. This is the lie upon which Mormonism is built. Moroni appearing to Joseph Smith. And this is the lie upon which Seventh-day Adventism is built. The angel appearing to Ellen G. White, and that becomes their doctrine, but it has to do with the Sabbath. Overlooking that our Sabbath is fulfilled in Christ. You can go to church on Sunday, you can go to church on Saturday, on Tuesday we can have a midweek Bible study. But our Sabbath is in him. It's not in a day. Be very careful of people who tell you otherwise. Again, the very deception that gave us Seventh-day Adventism, gave us Mormonism, gave us uh, Islam, and gave us various other superstitions of Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy. These things are dangerous. But let's continue looking now. There are things called estripions that existed in the Greek world and then in the Greco-Roman world, where there was a belief that there were healing properties to mineral water, not because of what they were chemically, or chemical benefit from mineral water hot springs, but they worshipped gods of healing at these places, Asclepions, uh, in the Greek world and the Roman world. There are some scholars who believe that this was a polemic against the pagan Asclepions. It was right next to the immediate north, separated by a small valley, according to Josephus, from the fortress Antonio, the Roman garrison in Jerusalem that overlooked the temple. Uh, the belief is that Jesus was showing the worship of other gods and going to other gods for healing doesn't work. It's only the worship of the true God that works. There are those who make that argument. The problem with that argument is even though it is in principle true, the name Bethesda, the name Bethesda with the five porticos, and it's not even an Aramaic name, it's a Hebrew name, shows that this was not any likelihood an Asclepion, an Asclepion. But there are those who were saying that Jesus was trying to show the Romans and the Jews and so forth who were influenced by Greco-Roman culture the Hellenized Jews that, look, these other gods can heal, only the true one can. Well, what they're saying is in principle true, but that's not the meaning of Bethesda. The argument that it was an Asclepion, I must disagree with those scholars who say that. But let's go a bit further with this. The five porticos. Somehow, these five porticos correspond to the five witnesses, to the five witnesses that we see later in the chapter to Jesus and his Messiahship. But now the man is told, when he's healed, pick up your pallet. Why does Jesus tell the person healed from polio to get back in their wheelchair? Why does Jesus tell the person with uh, paralysis in his lower extremities to pick up his crutches when they don't physically, medically, clinically need them anymore. Again, it was the piece of wood to which his flesh was confined. Let's look at the healing aspect now. Again, there were congregated here many infirm people, many. I read this carefully in Greek day before yesterday. I have not read it in Greek in a long time, but I read it in Greek the day before yesterday. There were many people congregated here, many, okay? Notice that Jesus healed only one. <laughs> he healed the one his father told him to heal. He healed that one and that one alone. Uh, be careful of these word, faith, money con artists today who are going around telling people, 
we can lay the hands on the sick and they will always recover and things like this. Uh, this is not true. This is not true. There were places where Jesus did heal everyone. There were other places and times when he did not heal everyone. He only healed when and where his father told him. Remember, Philippians chapter 2. The theological term is kenosis. Although he existed in the form of God, he said we couldn't comprehend that. He took the form of a servant. Think of the book written by the American author Mark Twain that was a docufiction based on Edward VI, where he supposedly had a boy who looked a lot like him in London during the time of Henry VIII, when Henry VIII was about to die. And he, he had the uh, street boy, the waif, fill in for him while he went out and played in the mud and tried to be just an ordinary kid in the slums of the city of London, having left Hampton Palace. There's a Walt Disney movie about it called The Prince and the Pauper, but it's a book written by the American author Mark Twain uh, based on the reign of Edward VI. Uh, the kid was still the king, but he divested himself of the powers and privilege of his royalty. Jesus remained God, but he divested himself of the power and privilege of his deity. When Satan tempted Jesus in Matthew 4, Satan was trying to get Jesus to exercise his divine power out of concert with the Father. We've explained this many times. He tried, as it were, to get Jesus to act in the flesh. Uh, people forget this. He subjected himself to the will of the Father. He did not feed the 5,000 because he was God or walk on the water because he was God. He could have, but he did not. He only did what his Father told him to do in the power of the Holy Spirit as an example to us. Look, please, if you don't know this verse, I only say some of these things I know you generally know, but I say it for the sake of the uh, podcast and for the recording that will go on to RTN. Look with me, please, to the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 5, verse 17, very briefly, once again. We mentioned this recently. We are told the dunamis, the power of the Lord was present for him to perform healing. Jesus would not do it unless the power of the Lord was present for him to do it. Even though he was God and even though he could have done it of his own power as God, he waited only when the Father told him to and the Holy Spirit empowered him. He would not do it otherwise. And we cannot do it otherwise. Be careful of these money-preaching scoundrels who go around and say, I'm going to lay hands on the sick and we're going to anoint them with oil and we're going to command this cancer or this polio or this cystic fibrosis to disappear in the name of Jesus. And then when it doesn't disappear, they put the sick Christian under condemnation saying, you don't have any faith. I knew a case of an elderly, well, I know more than one case, but one case in particular, there was an elderly woman who was sick. She was going to be with the Lord soon, godly lady her whole life. The only thing she had left was her faith in Jesus. She had no family. She was a widow. The only thing she had left was her faith in Jesus. And one of these money-preaching connivers tried to take that from her, telling her she didn't have faith or she would have been healed. These people are at best ignorant, and what they do is cruel. It's just not like that. Yes, we can pray for the sick. We can anoint the sick with oil for the eldership. But even someone with the gift of healing cannot command a disease to disappear or command a, a, a corpse to come back to life unless the Holy Spirit is telling you and empowering you to do that in a specific situation. Otherwise, they're not going to get up. Oh, we can pray for them. 
and ask the Lord to intervene and ask the Lord to give their physicians wisdom. But if you say, in the name of Jesus, I command this to disappear, the Holy Spirit better be telling you to do that. And you better know it. Now, healing is perhaps the most conspicuous example of this, but it is a general truth. Be careful of people who go around praying in tongues all the time. So much of it is gibberish. This is not to dismiss the biblical gift of tongues, but it's not something we can do at will. The Holy Spirit must come on you to exercise a charismatic gift. Be careful of people who go around having prophecies and words of knowledge every 10 minutes. That's not the way it works. The Holy Spirit must come on you and give you that in a given situation. Otherwise, it is clairvoyance, not prophecy. As Jeremiah says, they prophesy from the deception and futility of their own mind. Whenever a charismatic gift is manifested, genuinely and authentically, when it's the power of God and it's the Holy Spirit, it's God the Father by his Spirit and the name of his Son causing it to happen in that given situation. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. An angel got Peter out of jail. Didn't get Stephen out. <laughs> God does not always work the same in every situation. Now, here we talk about it in terms of healing. All those sick people laying around, and Jesus heals one, the one his father told him to. That is the way the gift of healing always works. Otherwise, it's not really the gift of healing. Now, let's continue looking at this. It was the Sabbath day, and the Jews, now understand the term here, Jews, there's a translation issue from the Greek Judeoi. It doesn't mean people who were Jewish. They were all Jewish. Jesus was Jewish. They're all Jewish. It meant the Judeans, the religious establishment, the Sanhedrin, and the people they controlled, and the religious party membership of the Sadducees and Pharisees. It had to do with the religious politi and political power establishment of the Sanhedrin and of the religious parties, the Pharisees and Sadducees, the Judeans and those who they controlled. In modern Israel, it's much the same. Haifa and Tel Aviv are much more secular cities. But when you go to Jerusalem, it's much more controlled demographically by religious Jews. Well... This is simply a modern version of what happened then. The Judeans, the people in the south around Jerusalem, were strongly under the influence of the Sanhedrin, and you had a hyper-concentration of Pharisees and Sadducees, even though they existed elsewhere. Now let's look at this. They come to the man who was cured. It's the Sabbath day. It's not permissible for you to carry your pallet. But he answered, he who made me well was the one who said to me, pick up your pallet and walk. And I asked him, who is this man who said to you, pick up your pallet and walk? But the man who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had slipped away while there was a crowd in that place. And afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Behold, you have become well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse befalls you. And the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. For this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing things on the Sabbath. But he answered, my father is working and I am working still. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. Man was not made for the Sabbath. There were conditions where it could have been violated. Now, if the Sabbath was desecrated, like in the old law where the guy gathered the sticks, that was a sin. But to save a life, that was something else. 
a Jew, halakhically, by Jewish law today, by rabbinic law, can break every one of the commandments of the Torah to save a human life except three. Idolatry, no idolatry. Murder, he can't commit, he can't murder an innocent person. And the third, sexual perversion, homosexuality, something like that. He cannot engage in sexual perversion, obviously idolatry, and he, he cannot murder an innocent person. All of the other 613 commandments a Jew can break to save his life. But that was because of the influences of Christianity on Judaism that the rabbis, Talmudic Judaism, rabbinism, redefined or recodified the law. They would have killed people for this in the time of Jesus. Uh, but they came under certain influences later on that came from the Judeo-Christian world that caused them to modify the, their rabbinic law. Well, let's understand this. Sin no more. It is absolutely wrong to suggest all sin is the result of a specific sin. It may be, or it may not be. Now, it's all a result of sin in the general sense. Man has fallen. The world is in the power of the wicked one. The homotosphere, the wages of sin is death. It's the wage that people get sick and then die. It's, it's it, okay, Jesus came to reverse that for those who repent and believe, but in that sense, all illness is a result of sin in the broad sense, but not in the specific personal sense. We are told in James, and it's quite clear, even in English, as well as in the original Greek, let him call for the elders and anoint him with oil. And if he has sinned, it will be forgiven him. Illness can cause sin. We see this in Psalm 32. Uh, when I remained silent about my sin, my body wasted away. But Job did not sin. Job was a righteous man. His illness was not the consequence of his personal sin. So we need to take note of that, that a specific illness may not be the consequence of a specific sin. On the other hand, it may be. Christian physicians who've looked at this text with a medical eye have speculated that to this day there are forms of sexually transmitted diseases, venereal diseases in Africa, the Middle East, and certain areas of Asia that result in dystrophy to the lower extremities. In other words, paralysis. There are forms of sexual sin that have consequences for the neuromuscular system. Uh, left untreated, there were no antibiotics in those days, so what are you left with? It may have been that. It may have been that. No one can be positive. But we do know whatever sin that, that it was, it resulted in his illness. Jesus tells him, Sin no more. Hence, pick up your pallet, the piece of wood. As I've explained before, and my apologies to you people, dear brethren who know it, but we have other people who are going to listen to this on the internet who don't, hopefully. Anything in Hebrew made from a tree is called tree. The Hebrew word for tree and wood is the same. Even a pencil you write with is called it's. It's something made from wood. It's called tree. It's cursed is everyone in the Torah who hangs on and eats a tree. Tree is tree. Anything made from tree is tree in Hebrew. The word for wood and tree is the same. Okay. Now let's understand this a bit. For in Greek it's dendrite, but in Hebrew the word is tree. Now, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. What Jesus was telling this man in figure was, pick up your cross, live a crucified life. In my teenage years, I took psychedelic drugs, cannabis, and LSD. 
By the time I was 16, I experimented with heroin. I didn't like it. So instead, I got strung out on cocaine. I'm not proud of it, but I did it, and Jesus delivered me from it. How did he deliver me from drug abuse, from addiction? Simple. The cross. Why don't I want to go out and take these illegal drugs and self-harming drugs now? Why is it that I will not use any drug for non-medical reason? I don't know. Because of the cross. The old man, the old creation had to be crucified. Now, for me, it was drugs. For other people, it's other things. I'm only speaking for me. That was the strongest thing Satan had on me. Um. Other things still need to be crucified. Pick up your cross and follow me. Pick up your pallet. Uh, that's what he says. When he heals us, he heals us from sin. The healing from the paralysis was secondary, was perfunctorial. It wasn't about the healing. Remember, when Jesus healed people, he normally said, shh, don't tell anybody. Or if it was something like leprosy, all right, you have to go show yourself to the high priest and, and do the ritual prescribed in the Torah because he had not fulfilled the Torah yet with his death and resurrection and Pentecost. So, okay, go do that. <clears throat> but it usually was, shh, tell nobody. This guy was there 38 years the guy was elated. That's not where Jesus put the emphasis. Jesus put the emphasis on sin no more. Keep your flesh confined to that piece of wood. Pick up your cross. That's where Jesus put the emphasis. As I've said many times, Jesus had healing, but he never had a healing crusade. He had a repentance crusade. When you see these televangelists and these money preachers coming through, healing crusade, healing crusade, that is not God. That is not of Jesus. That is at best an ignorant person, at best. Too often a religious con artist out for money. Keep away from that stuff. Healing crusades. Oh, there's healings. But that was never the focus of Jesus' message or ministry. He tells this guy, sin no more. That was the main issue to him. It's what causes the sin. Ah, the illness. It's not the illness itself. Now we see this gentleman in the temple. Jesus finds him in the temple. What happens when someone meets the Lord? <laughs> when the Lord sets someone free. When the Lord empowers somebody to walk, where do they go? <laughs> they go to the temple. They go to the place of worship. We have different words for temple in Greek. Heron, oikos, hegios, naos. But remember, seven times the New Testament calls the church the temple. Not the building with the temple not made with human hands, Peter says but to the temple. When somebody meets the Lord, they have to come into fellowship if they're in his will. If somebody is out of fellowship, they're going to throw the cross away. Now, I'm not talking about Christians in Saudi Arabia, where I've been to where there is no fellowship, or Christians in prison for their faith in China or North Korea. God bless those people. Those people are going to be so close to the throne in glory that the rest of us, you know, will need sunglasses to look at them. Um, God bless those, those people. Um, but that's the way it is. You go to the temple. You go to the church, to the body of Christ. After you meet the Lord, forsake not the fellowshipping together one with another, especially as you see the day approaching. Where does Jesus meet him the second time? In the place of fellowship. Where does Jesus meet us? In the place of fellowship. 
Yes, personal prayer time, personal devotions, the Lord will meet with us there. But he meets with us corporately in the temple. Before this, he's at the pool of Bethesda, at the porticos, <laughs> laying around there with people who are sick. Once he gets healed, he's no longer with sick people. He's with healed people. We're the same. Bad company corrupts good morals. We're not to have relationships with unsaved people except one, to witness to them. Two, being in the world but not of it. We have to work with people. And three, we can have unsaved families. But we, we, we don't per se socialize with unsaved people. Christians should not marry unsaved people. You should not enter business relationships that are legally binding with unsaved people. It's an unequal yoking. Marriage, obviously not. Um, believers should not be in liberal or Roman Catholic churches. Those are people who are sick, who need to be healed, who need to meet Christ. Now, if we go to the pool of Bethesda, we go there to tell them about Christ. But we find our fellowship in the temple with other believers. Bad company corrupts good morals. We have to be very careful about our associations with unsaved people. We're in the world, not of it. We have to work with them. We have unsaved families. But our focus must always be on the fact that these people are lost. I was at the supermarket today. That cashier, as far as I knew, was lost. I told him, God bless you. Uh, I try to carry tracks to give out when I can. But remember, every unsaved person we come in contact with is on their way to hell. And we have the message to keep them from going there. They're not going to be healed by religion. They're going to hang around at that pool waiting for something to happen that isn't going to happen. Uh, you have to meet the Lord. You have to meet the Lord. Those who've met the Lord go to the temple. And that's where the Lord comes afterwards to meet them. And so it happens with this gentleman. It happens. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus. For this reason, they were persecuting him. Now, verse 18, for this reason, therefore, the Judeans were seeking all the more to kill him because he not only was breaking the Sabbath as they misunderstood the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own father making himself equal with God. Islam tries to make the big deal out of the fact that Jesus never claimed to be God. He never said, I am God. He never said it in those words, but he said he was God. He said he was God. If you look at the Muslim apologist for Islam, I was supposed to debate Ahmed Didat, but he had the stroke in South Africa. Um, where? Show me in the New Testament where Jesus ever said, I am God. Worship me. He said he was God. He just didn't say it in those words. Now we'll see why he didn't say it in those words in a moment. Let's look. Verse 19. Therefore Jesus answered, truly, truly, when you say something twice in a Semitic language, you make it emphatic. My wife and myself, we speak Hebrew to each other sometimes. And if it's cold out, and she comes in, and I want to know if it's cold. Probably is, is cold out. It's like kar Kar, kar. Cold, cold. <laughs> Are you tired? On the if, if. You, you say something twice. It's the way of saying very, even in modern Semitic languages. <coughs> when you see verily, verily, or truly, truly, that is the cardinal verse in the passage. The whole passage, the other verses, hinge on it. You've got to get the truly, truly bit right to understand what the passage is trying to convey. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a man is born of the water and the spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God as another example. Well, let's look. <coughs> 
I say to you, the Son of Man can do nothing unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in the like manner. If Jesus subjected himself to that kind of limitation, and he was the only one who could have done it, because he was God, but he wouldn't act out of concert with the Father, even when tempted by Satan to do so in Matthew 4 and Luke 4, what makes people think they can? <laughs> uh, I have a guy I know, and he's teaching error now about the return of Christ. The Lord didn't tell him to do it because he's teaching error. He's acting in his flesh. Nothing in the flesh ever works. Remember, God told Abraham, take Isaac, your only son. But wait a minute, there was an Ishmael. Yeah, there was. But God said, your only son is Isaac. God never recognizes anything done in the flesh, even if it might be done with good intention. We have to be motivated by the Lord, not the need. The Lord never recognizes anything done in the flesh. Uh, Christians can have a social gospel. They can be trying to help the poor and do good things. So many organizations, like uh, Bernardo's in England, and uh, most of the Salvation Army now, unfortunately, World Vision, these began as gospel preaching organizations, but they simply became social welfare organizations masquerading as Christianity. Uh, the Father's not in it. The Father is not in it. Oh, but we're doing good works and we're doing it in the name of Jesus. Yet, yeah, what did Jesus say in Matthew 7? Lord, do we not do good works in your name and miracles? And yeah, depart from me. I never knew you. You've got people in these organizations who are never even saved, who are never. E oh, what about Mother Teresa? Yeah, what about her? She said that she converted those people in Calcutta to be better Hindus and better Muslims. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. <laughs> Go to hell, go directly to hell without Christ. That was her gospel. How can you say that she helped so many poor people? Yeah, in her own strength and in her own wisdom. If she was doing the work and will of the Father, she would have pointed people to the Son and told those Hindus and Muslims they need to be saved by Jesus. Oh, you can't say that! Well, no, the New Testament says it. What is ordained by the Father? Well, let's look. There are organizations who support Israel composed of born-again believers. And they have good intention, and they love Israel, and they understand there's a prophetic purpose of God for the restoration of Israel nationally, but they sign agreements or have policies not to evangelize. There's one that calls itself Bridges for Peace, between Jews and Christians. Now, if there's no Christ, there's no peace. It's only him who breaks down the wall of partition. There's an organization that is a spiritual fraud, calls itself the International Christian Embassy. It was people from Vancouver who were among the founders who realized it went off. Um, the Watsons, uh, if you know them, the musical family in, 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 in British Columbia. Uh, this organization says they're the ambassadors of Jesus, but they don't preach him. Paul says we are ambassadors of Christ because we do preach him. They're not a Christian embassy. They're, they're spiritual frauds. They're spiritual frauds completely. We have to understand the Father must be in it. And the Father points people to the Son. And when it's the Father, it'll always be in agreement with Scripture. It'll not be a social gospel. Do we help the poor? Of course we do. But the biggest need for a poor person is the same as the biggest need for a wealthy person, salvation. 
Do we support Israel? Absolutely. But the biggest need for Israel is their salvation. They're going to be deceived by the Antichrist to make a covenant with death. The biggest need of any Jew is to come to know Yeshua as the Messiah. That's the biggest need. And I support Israel. But let's look. We go on. For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son, so that all will honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Notice that Jesus is worthy of co-equal honor as the Father. They are equal in nature. They are not equal in position, but in nature. If you have a child or a grandchild, they are not equal to you in position, but they are equal to you in nature. You are both homo sapiens. We are all homo sapiens. Equal in position? No. Equal in nature? Yes. Jesus is entitled to the same honor as God, as his father. And his father gives him all judgment. Now this is something interesting. We'll come back to this at the end of the chapter shortly. But let's look. He's given judgment to the son. Those who do not honor the son do not honor the father. He who does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. People claim they worship God the Father, but they reject the Messiah. Talmudic Judaism, Rabbinism, is a false Judaism. It rejects its own Messiah. They're not worshiping Yahweh. Remember, false religions worship the ism. Islam does not believe and worship Allah, the Abitaean moon god. Islam worships Islam. If you know a Jehovah's Witness, they don't worship Jehovah, they worship the Watchtower Society. Mormons worship Mormonism. Roman Catholics worship, quote unquote, Holy Mother the Church. They worship the ism. Judaism is the same. They worship the ism. They deify the ism. You cannot worship the true God unless you worship his son through him. Then it continues. One of the great verses of the Bible, chapter 5, verse 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life, does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death unto life. Unsaved people are dead already. They are spiritually dead. Their biological death will be perfunctorial. Saved Christians, it's the opposite. We are spiritually alive. Our biological death will be merely perfunctorial also. Our funeral has taken place at our baptism. We've become new creations. We've died with Christ and we're new creations. There's no death for a believer, only life. There's no life for a non-believer, only death. The unsaved have no life, only death. The truly saved have no death, only life. What happens biologically is perfunctorial. And for the believer will be of no ultimate consequence anyway because of the resurrection. Well, let's continue to look at this. You pass out of death unto life. Unsaved people are zombies. They're the living dead. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming. An hour is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. So he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. And he gave him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Whenever the scripture speaks of Jesus coming to earth, it's never as the Son of God. He's the Son of God in heaven, in eternity. On earth, he's always the Son of Man. He identifies with us and is identified with us. 
Do not marvel in this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear the voice and will come forth. Those who did the good deeds to the resurrection of life, those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. This is not talking about, not talking about, you can work your way into heaven with good deeds. No, no. The previous verses tell us you must believe in the Son, then have the good deeds. Okay. Unsaved people can do good things. They can give to charities. They can do, st but God doesn't recognize it. God does not recognize their deeds as good. He does not recognize what's done in the flesh. He only recognizes what's done in Christ. When we do good deeds, it's the righteousness of Christ in and through us. It's not our own righteousness. True, we will be rewarded for it, but we will be rewarded on the basis of our faith in him obedience, and so forth to him. Jesus says, do not marvel. This hour is going to come. It's going to come. Now this relates, of course, to Daniel chapter 12. There'll be two resurrections, one for the righteous, one for the unrighteous. This relates to the book of Revelation. There's two resurrections, one for the believers and one for the non-believers. I can do nothing on my own initiative. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. If I alone testify about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who testifies of me, and I know that that testimony which he gives about me is true. Again, the resurrection goes back to Daniel 12. Understand this. One of the most mysterious but important verses in Scripture, it's important, is when Jesus dies, the Old Testament saints are seen walking around Jerusalem. Okay? Why? They die, or they, they have to be part of the final resurrection. Oh, they have to be part of the final resurrection glorification of the saints. Under the law, they couldn't be. When Jesus gave up the ghost, he went to the bosom of Abraham and revealed himself to those people, and they were seen walking around. Okay, <clears throat> uh, The Messiah had to die before they could raise from the dead. They could not raise from the dead apart from faith in the Messiah. Well, let's look. He talks about this, and he talks about the judgment, and then he continues by saying, if I alone testify about myself, in Jewish law, based on the scriptures, your testimony about yourself only carries merit when you are accused, like John 7.51. Our law does not permit us to condemn a man without hearing from him. Uh, so often I've been the victim of gossip about things that people have put on the internet about me that are not true or are half true or distortions of, 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 of truths so often. And I asked it, well, wait a minute, if you thought that I did this or you sus did you ask me? No, but I read it on the internet. God's law does not permit that. We read in Proverbs, chapter 18, verse 17, the first to present this case seems right till another comes and examines him. You need hardcore proof. Now, if you have a video of me saying something heretical or something, that's something different. Then you've got witnesses. Then you've got proof. But be careful of gossip. It is in that case where there's accusation, a juridical accusation, 
that someone can testify for themselves. Otherwise, they cannot. Jesus cites five other witnesses who bear witness to him. He does not bear witness to himself. Now be careful. I've warned many times, warned about, warned about people who go around claiming to be prophets. If you see somebody going around claiming to be a prophet, the likelihood is they're a false one. And the likelihood is also that they're out to make a prophet. <laughs> people who predict things in the name of the Lord that are time specific and fail to happen. <sighs> What is this? If somebody's really a prophet, they don't say so. Amos says, I'm not a prophet or the son of a prophet. I'm a herdsman, I'm a shepherd. Real prophets don't want that job. Nobody in their right mind wants that job. If somebody is a prophet, other people say that is a prophet. If somebody has the gift of teaching, other people say that brother has the gift of teaching. We cannot bear witness to ourselves. We cannot appoint ourselves a pastor or a shepherd. Only God can ordain a minister, and he confirms it to other people. Remember, Acts 13, the Holy Spirit said, Set out for me Barnabas and Saul, and it was confirmed to and through the body. Barnabas and Paul did not claim to be missionaries. Okay. Only God can ordain a minister. The Lord's ministers are ministers of the Lord, not the church, but it's not they who say it about themselves. It is only afterwards that Paul says, by the grace of God, I am what I am, not least among the apostles. But initially, it was not Paul who claimed to be that. Be careful of people going around proclaiming themselves to be certain things, particularly prophets. If somebody is that, they don't have to say it. Other people are going to see it and know it. Now, he gives the five witnesses. And these five witnesses correspond to the five porticos. There's obviously a correspondence. It's not it, but there's a correspondence. The first witness we see is in verse uh, 32. Therefore, another who testifies of me, and I know the testimony which he gives about me is true. Who is this other? Well, obviously, it's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the first witness. When somebody is born again, they must be drawn by the Father to the Son by the Holy Spirit. The Father draws people to Christ by the Holy Spirit. Someone cannot be saved without the ministry of the person of the Holy Spirit. The second is the witness of John the Baptist, Yohanan Hamatbil. John the Baptist, or John the Baptizer, was the second witness. John came in the spirit and power of Elijah. Now, there's much we can say about this. We won't do it now. But we have other teachings related to John the Baptist, a man not like other men, and how he relates to Elijah, and what that means for the end of the age, for the return of Christ. But understand something. These same witnesses, these same five witnesses, that affirm his messiahship all come into play at the end of the age once again concerning Israel and concerning the church the Holy Spirit I will pour out my spirit in all flesh I will show signs and wonders the miracles the works Elijah must come again last thing it says in the Old Testament is Elijah's going to come. John the Baptist, of course, came in the spirit of, of Elijah. Then the scriptures, and then the Father. 
these five things will, in constellation, unite to proclaim the return of Christ as the true Christ. These five things. The Antichrist will try to counterfeit it, but he will not be able to do it. He'll pervert the scriptures. He'll have a false spirit, the spirit of Antichrist, the New Testament calls it. He'll have a false harbinger. The false prophet will be the satanic equivalent of John the Baptist. Okay, His father will be Satan. He'll try to, Antichrist will try to counterfeit this thing. But if it's Christ, you always have the same five witnesses. You always have the same five witnesses. What is unique about John? None born among women is greater than John. Apart from Jesus, John was the greatest man who ever lived. He was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. He recognized Jesus embryonically before either of them was born. None born among women. John the Baptist represents the ultimate possible degree of righteousness under the law or by religion. By religious practice, you cannot possibly be any more righteous than John the Baptist or even as righteous as John the Baptist. But John the Baptist said, I'm not worthy to tie Jesus' sandal. Jesus said of John, he who was least in the kingdom is greater than John. What did he mean? Does this mean John's not in the kingdom? That's nonsense. What it means is this. When we are born again, we have the imputed righteousness of Christ. He takes our sin to give us his righteousness. He takes our death to give us his life. While John represented the paramount, the apex of righteousness by religious observance. The one who has the imputed righteousness of Christ is greater. Our righteousness is not our own. It's the righteousness of Jesus. Unsaved people must understand this. They must accept the witness of John and what it represents, particularly Jews, but Jews are just a microcosm of the human condition. Religion is not good enough. Religion cannot justify us. Religion cannot save us. Religion cannot give us eternal life. John baptized with water, but he said the Messiah is going to baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now remember what Jesus said when he was challenged. Let me ask you a question. Was the John the Baptist and his baptism, was that of God or of man? And they didn't want to answer because the people held John to be a prophet. So Jesus said, if you can't tell me, I'm not going to tell you. What did he mean? He did not mean, when well, if you don't tell me, I'm not going to tell you. That's not what he meant. What he meant was, if you cannot accept the message of John, righteousness under the law and its inadequacy, you cannot possibly accept the message of I have, unless you realize the conviction of sin and the futility of trying to save yourself by religious observation and good works, unless you come to that realization as John did, you can't possibly come to faith in Christ. This relates to what Jesus meant by the poor of spirit, the poor in spirit. We have to recognize our complete and utter spiritual bankruptcy. No matter how righteous or religious somebody is, like John, he was the greatest. It's not good enough. It cannot bring salvation. It is only Christ that can bring salvation. So the first witness is the spirit. The second witness is the witness of John. There's only one religion that God ever ordained. Remember that the gospel is not a religion. Religion is man trying to reach God 
The gospel is God trying to reach man. There's only one religion God ordained, and that was Old Testament Judaism, Levitical Mosaic Judaism. That was designed to teach about the coming Messiah, but it was also designed to teach that we have sin and cannot save ourselves. We need a Messiah. That's the purpose of the law, Paul tells us in Romans, to teach that we're sinful, have sin, and we can't save ourselves. We need the Messiah. Okay. So, John represents this. Nobody can be more righteous than John by religion. And he says, well, I'm nothing compared to this. Jesus says, unless you can accept the message of John, you can't accept what I have to say. Unless you know you're no good and you can't save yourself, I can't save you. That's the second witness, the witness of John. Then we get to the next witness. The next witness is the witness of the Father. The Father who sent me, he has testified of me. You've neither heard his voice in any time, nor even seen his form. You do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe him whom he sent. What is God the Father like? What is he like? This God who is such a mystery to us. What is God the Father like? What is he like? He's like Jesus. You want to know what God is like? Look at Jesus. The full nature and character of the Father is manifested in him bodily. We haven't seen him. We haven't seen his form. We can't see him. Therefore, he has to become, God has to become a man. Jesus comes in human form to reveal the Father to us. The Father bears witness to the Son. The Father bears witness to the Son. Show us the Father. What does Jesus tell Philip? Have I been with you and you not, don't recognize me? Don't recognize me? I, I've been with you. <laughs> Show us the Father. You're looking, you're looking. I have the same nature, the same. The Father bears witness to the Son. You want to know what I'm like? Look at my Son. You want to know what, what, what my nature is, my essence is, my character is? Look at my son. Well, then we have the next witness. We have the witness, he says, believe because of the works. Nassim beniflaot, signs and wonders. The Jews believed that there were certain things, again, only the Messiah could do. Even in modern medical science, neural regeneration is not yet a possibility. If the optic nerve is dead, a person is not going to see again. They're just beginning to try to find ways with microchips to transmit signals across the dendrites. But the optic nerve is dead or the audio nerve is dead. That's it. The, the nerve, neural tissue, neurons don't regenerate. Cytons can repair, but they cannot regenerate. Cannot regenerate. The Jews believed only the Messiah could make a blind person see and a deaf person hear. Well, it's still like that. Only Jesus can make a blind person see and a deaf person hear. If the, if, if, if the audio nerve or the optic nerve is completely dead, if it's in the cross tissue, the only way a person like that is going to see medically, physically, is if the Lord causes it to happen contrary to nature. Medical science can't help a person like that. Um, but again, it means something spiritually. Until we see the light, we're blind. Until we hear his voice, we are deaf. Talk to somebody who grew up nominally Christian, Protestant, Catholic, Eastern Orthodox. When they get saved, how come I couldn't see this? He's right in front of me the whole time. 
How come I couldn't see the true gospel? I heard this about Jesus and this and this, but it was only religion to me. When you have that personal encounter with him, it's because you heard his voice and you've seen the light. <laughs> only the Messiah can do that miracle. It's a miracle he can only do biologically for some people. But it's a miracle he wants to do spiritually for all people, all who will believe. And then we have the witness of the scripture personified in Moses. I come in my father's name. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and they testify to me. To search the scripture means inquire into, inquire into. In Hebrew, to inquire into is darash, darash. We get the word midrash, from the inquiring into, Jewish exegesis. Midrash means from the drash, from the inquiring into. Okay. They bear witness to me. Now this, of course, again, goes back to the five, to Moses. And he tells the religious establishment, don't think that I'm going to accuse you. It'll be Moses who accuses you. The law, the Torah, indicts. For non-Jews, it's the Ten Commandments. Now, of course, as we pointed out, Nine of the Ten Commandments are reiterated in the New Testament. Nine of the Ten are reiterated. The only laws from the Old Testament we have to keep are the ones that are reiterated in the New. But unsaved people have to keep the Ten Commandments. As Ray Comfort says, how many lies you have to tell to be a liar? <laughs> if there's somebody who's not a liar, I never met him. When you look in the mirror, you're looking at a liar. You're looking, if you covet something, you've stolen it in the holy perfection of God. You look in the mirror, you're looking at a thief and a liar. You lust after somebody you're not married to, you've slept with them. You're looking at an adulterer, a fornicator. Every time you look in the mirror, you're looking at somebody who is sexually immoral, dishonest, and a crook. <laughs> Everybody's broken the Ten Commandments. Everybody. Everybody. There's people I dislike intently. But if I hate them, if I desire to see them dead instead of saved. Now there's people, I have no problem killing Ben Laden. But I would have much preferred for him to have gotten saved. <laughs> than to have gotten taken out of the game. There are people I, I can't fathom, but I'd much prefer for them to get saved and get killed. <laughs> or, or the, you know, I want God to raise his hand against some of these people, but I prefer they got saved. Even the worst people in the world, the dictator of North Korea, he's one of the most evil people in the world. I'd rather that man got saved because he's going to go to hell. It doesn't mean we don't like. It doesn't mean we don't want to see God raise his hand against them. It doesn't mean that in self-defense we might not kill them. It doesn't mean any of that. But the idea was repentance and regeneration. You hate somebody. When you really hate somebody, it means you don't want them, you don't care about their salvation. When you really hate somebody, it means you don't care about their salvation. <clears throat> That's the ultimate acid test. Do you care about this? Would you rather see them saved? <coughs> now let's go a little further with this. So there's a trial. Now can you imagine you're on trial for your life? A capital crime only exponentially, astronomically, uh, infinitely worse. You're on trial for eternity, the second death. No appeal. 
Now, if the judge is your defense attorney, your barrister, if the judge is also your barrister, how can you possibly lose? The court is rigged. The verdict is fixed. If the lawyer trying to get you off is the judge, you're not going to be convicted. Wow, well, that's something. For the same Christian, the trial is rigged. It's fixed. Our judge is our lawyer. We can't possibly lose. The plea? I can let this guy off because I paid for what he did. I can let her off because I myself paid for what she did. I paid the penalty. I paid the fine in full. Oh, they're guilty. But justice has been satisfied. I took their sin to give them my righteousness. If the judge and the barrister, the defense attorney, are the same person, you can't possibly lose. On the other hand, if that's not the situation, you can't possibly win. The law condemns us. The Ten Commandments given to Moses. Moses is the prosecuting attorney. John Bunyan wrote about this beautifully in the Pilgrim's Progress. Now this is a general truth because of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, but it is a specific truth to unsaved Jewish people. If you believed Moses, you'd believe me also, Jesus said. Remember, the problem with unsaved Jews and religious Jews, Orthodox Jews, Hasidic Jews, their problem is not that they don't believe in Jesus as the Messiah. Their rejection of Jesus as the Messiah is the result of the problem. It is the tragic consequence of the problem. It is the inevitable repercussion of the problem, but it's not the problem. The problem is they don't believe Moses and the Torah. If an Orthodox Jew, if any Jew, but especially an Orthodox, if a rabbi really believed Moses and the Torah, they would know Jesus is the Messiah. Their rejection of him is a ramification of their rejection of Moses, the witness of Moses. So we have these five witnesses. The Holy Spirit, the works, signs, and with the miracles Jesus did, the resurrection, being the ultimate, the Father raised him. Third, the witness of the Father, the witness of John, the ministry of Elijah, and then ultimately, of course, the witness of the scriptures, of the law, five witnesses. Antichrist will again attempt to counterfeit this. He'll have a counterfeit for each one of these things. That is a separate subject. But that is the subject we look at now for us. Jew and Gentile alike, Christian and non-Christian, the five witnesses. There'll always be those five. The Holy Spirit, the witness of John, which relates to the ministry of Elijah, the miracles Jesus did, uh, which are irrefutable. The resurrection is irrefutable. Of course, the Father raised him up. Okay. <coughs> 
the witness of the Father himself, and then the witness of the Scriptures. Those five witnesses will always come into play when somebody is saved. Always. And so all of us, now we're at the five, the five porticos, the five porches that lead into the waters of salvation, of grace, rather, uh, by the sheep gate, the sheep pool that was later called by some Christians. That's where unsaved people are. That's where we used to be until we met Jesus. And he told us to pick up our pallets and walk and to sin no more. And then we come to the temple. This will bring us into conflict with the world. But it will particularly bring us into conflict with religion with religious people. When we look in the book of Revelation, it's Babylon the Great. It's the false religious system of the world that is the footstool of the Antichrist and false prophet. That is what is the final conflict with believers. Papal Rome, Papal Rome has murdered more believers than pagan Rome over the centuries. Right from the beginning, Unbelieving Jews were persecuting believing Jews from the martyrdom of Stephen onward. Islam kills so many Christians and the world says nothing. When we go to the temple, when we pick up our pallet, when the Lord heals us at the pool of Beth Chesda, the house of grace, tells us to sin no more, praise God. But until he returns, there will be a conflict. And at the forefront of that conflict will be organized religion. Even that which poses to be Christian. Remember, the law was true. The Torah was true. But it was distorted by the Sanhedrin. By the Pharisees, by the Sadducees, by the Herodians, by the Essenes, it was distorted. Nothing wrong with what Moses taught. Showed there was something wrong with us. The conflict came with religion, with false Judaism. And with us, the conflict will be with false Judaism, particularly for Jewish believers, but it will be with false Christianity. Things don't change. This is John 5. We've been going for a while. I thank you so much for listening. I hope we didn't go on too long. If there's any questions specifically about tonight's subject, I'll try to answer. But please keep it focused on tonight's subject. Thank you, Jacob. There was a lot to take on board there. There was a lot that... Um... I didn't know previously. I'm sure many of us are still making notes, and uh, I think there's many questions to be asked tonight. So thank you very much again Jacob, for all you put forward. If anybody does have any questions and you don't get a chance to ask them before we finish tonight, if you go to the RTN website, rtn.org, you will see the chat page there. And if you don't get your, your question asked tonight or get, get responded to, simply type your question to there and myself will charge, we'll make sure that Jacob gets it and he will follow up on that. But Jacob, thank you very much. A lot to go through. Thank you very much to those who joined us uh, during the, the meeting. I know quite a few people did, so welcome to you if you joined us through the, the meeting. Um, Our friends from Africa. We have some people from Africa? Uh, we've got Gert and his family. We've got folks. Uh, there was a lady from Africa. Um, okay. I don't remember her name. But she was there earlier. Gloria, Gloria Lessie is from oh. Saturday, South Africa. I don't know if she's still there or not, but Gloria is from South Africa. Jacob, I'll just start it's off. It's very late there now. It's midnight. It's after yeah. midnight. For that just, I'll get us running with the question. If anyone does want to ask a question, depending on which software you use, 
your mute button is in the top right of the screen or in the bottom left, depending on which type of software you use. If you want to ask a question and you need to just simply unmute your microphone, but your microphone will be controlled by that little button with three dots or mute or unmute. Jacob, yeah. I just want to bring yeah. things up to up the screen. I'm mute my listing. Fantastic. Thank you. Ask question. Okay. Okay, my brother. Thank you, Jacob. Okay. I just want to ask one question in relation to the world today. Okay, don't worry. And obviously the epidemic of COVID, etc., and its relation to the pool of Bethesda. <laughs> the pool itself no longer functions in the way that it did in biblical times, I'm and there's no equivalent today. There's no lords or knocking in in Ireland that people will make pilgrimage to. I just want to knock that down to make sure that. You can confirm that there's nowhere else that this thing, either today, um, performs that same function, and even the pool itself in Bethesda no longer performs that function. Absolutely not. But I will tell you one thing, fasten your seatbelt. Some years ago, I was leading a Bible study tour to Israel, and we had a young woman, a medical nurse, from England, and a Jewish businessman who was a believer paid for her to come on the Bible study tour. She wanted to see the promised land, the land of the scripture. She wanted to walk where Jesus walked before she died because she was diagnosed pre-terminal with breast cancer. And she was in her 30s. She was not old, she, but she had breast cancer. And she's still around. And she didn't have an easy life. She had a, Before she was saved, she was married to an unsaved guy who was a real criminal, a psycho. But she was diagnosed with breast cancer and she was on her way out and she had a son that concerned her. Um, and she came with us and we prayed for her at the pool of Bethesda in Jerusalem. And when she came back to England, she was in remission. Medically confirmed remission. Praise the Lord. Now, <laughs> praise God for that. But I would attribute that to the Lord, not to the location. <laughs> Thank you, Jacob. That's really Lord, that did have a symbolic meaning. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Colin Higgs, if Colin's still here, Colin, I know that you have a question for Jacob in relation to the angelic involvement of the pool. If you'd like to go ahead with your question, Colin. Yeah, I mean, uh, thank you for that, Jacob. I think you, you've answered most of my question, which I, I think I sent to you anyway, personally. Um, the, the thing that I find quite strange is you've explained it Prior to Jesus, these other people that went into the pool when the waters were troubled uh, don't obviously come under the same as the man who'd been ill for 38 years, as we find out from verse 14, when Jesus tells him his whole but to, to sin no more. Those others that went before, were they, they wouldn't have been saved by grace in any shape or form, would they? No, not be generous, no. So they're, they're healing. It would have been purely a, purely a medical healing that, that had a spiritual symbolism to it. Yeah, which is why, which is why I had a, a, a thought when I, when I went back to read it about it's very similar to the uh, Catholic and other traditions where they go to places like Lourdes. Remember, most early manuscripts do not say the angel stirred it. Right. That was... In later manuscripts, okay. it's not to say it wasn't in the originals. It's just to say we can't prove it was. It could be an interpolation, as I stated. But we do know that the word is moved, and people jumped in to get healed because of verse seven. Verse seven is in the, every early manuscript. Right. It's disputed by scholars if it actually says it was an angel who stirred it up, because we don't have any early manuscript that says it happened. Okay. 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 So, so, so in reality, it could have only been temporary healing because there, there, of there was course, no way. Because you're going to get yeah. sick anyway, just yeah. like Lazarus died again, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, anyone else got any questions? Sandra, seeing your screen um, coming on, I don't know if it's because you wanted to ask a question. Uh, yes. Uh, no. Yes. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, the gentleman, the lady with the glasses, we've just got a number. Um, we don't know your name, but um, the lady has just got the hand up. Are you asking a question, sir? Is that a lady? It's Reginald. Reginald, how are you? I can only see the lady. <laughs> it's good to see you, brother. I think uh, good, good evening, sir. Thank you for 
for inviting me. This is the first time I'm uh, enjoying a uh, uh, live. Uh, you can only see the top of your head. <laughs> Wait, can, can you see me now? No. Yeah. Oh, there you are, Reginald. I can see you now. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so thank you for inviting me for this. I enjoyed the. Uh, this very uh, teaching tonight, uh, there are a lot of things uh, Jacob said here that uh, I have been reading the scripture, but uh, there are things he opened my eyes to the, tonight that uh, I have never seen before, even though I have read the scripture. So I don't think I have any question to say, but just to, to say thank you to Jacob and uh, we are praying for for uh, for his for strength for God to keep uh, him for us, uh, we need uh, somebody who is strong at this time because uh, many the silence that um, uh, you, you, many Christians are no longer standing for the word of God. Uh, we need uh, we need the Jacob this time and uh, people like uh, Marco Quantana and you, Amos. Uh, just I want to say thank you. That is what I just my comment tonight. I don't want to say anything more than that. Bless you, Reginald. Good to speak to you. Okay. Anyone else got a question related to the teaching tonight? Rosie, I can see your lips move. Rosemary Valor? No, you weren't. Sorry, Rosemary. <laughs> we can't hear anything, Steve. You got no audio. Jacob, we look at today, we look at the whole COVID situation, we look at lockdown. We know a lot of fellowships and a lot of churches really are struggling, and some have actually gone to the wall, sadly. And as you mentioned in Hebrews chapter 25, 10, don't forsake the, the day of coming together. When we look at healing generally, Jacob, and we look at those situations where we have brethren who are seriously ill, who can't get to church, when I read the scripture in uh, James 5, where they're to call the elders to come and anoint them with oil, I've always understood that that's that situation where you can't get to church, so the eldership will come to you. How important is that today in the situation we're in with COVID, with legislation permitting? If somebody has COVID, it's like any other illness. They should take it to the Lord in prayer. And if somebody becomes seriously ill because of COVID, which normally means they have a respiratory condition or they're a geriatric patient, very old, then in that case, obviously, they should send for the elders. Um, there's nothing wrong with the elders making a home visit to somebody. It's not gotten to the state yet where they say you can't have visitors in your house. If it ever came to that state and we're given a choice between following the word of God or following the word of man, we follow the word of God and, and remain liable for the reper repercussions. There are anti-Christian politicians, evil people, in the United St States and elsewhere, in, in Scotland, in Scotland, who uh, would like to do this, who would like to, uh, they're already saying you can't have more than five people in your house and things like this. Uh, Remember, I, I'm trying to be careful here. I'm not saying there's no COVID, but I, what I am saying it is it's being politically exploited and orchestrated by people with an agenda that, among other things, is anti-Christian. Okay? We have to be aware of that. And it is setting the stage in part for what Jesus said. Um, you'll be persecuted by all nations for my namesake and things like this. Um, so we need to, now I'm not saying things may not have an interim improvement, but it does show how quickly things can change and how quickly it can impact the church. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Jacob. Anyone got a question? Uh, Mike. Yeah, I've just got a quick question, Jacob. Yes. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot for the teaching. Much to take in. Uh, you mentioned about the 38 years the man right. being 38 years old, and you, you made a reference to Numbers. Uh, yeah. Do you know the actual passage in Numbers? Uh, I think it's Numbers 32. Off the top of my head, I think it's chapter 32. I read it the other day. Because I'd always understood there were 40 years. Well, there are, there are but the, the judgment didn't begin with the 40. It began with the... We, uh, the golden calf, you know, with 
Yeah, yeah. So that's numbers 32, is it? I think so. Okay, all right, just give me an idea. I'll, I'll, I'll look it up afterwards. Uh, What's your concern in relation to that, Mike? What, 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 why the question? No, no, just, uh, I, I just wanted to be able to, you know, have a look at it afterwards type thing. I'd, ne I'd never seen that before. Yeah. I will get it, I will, I will email it to you, okay? Brilliant. Thanks, Jacob. Okay. Good stuff. Anyone else there got any questions? Okay. There was somebody else who was trying to... I have a comment you. I'd like to make. Can you hear Here, me? Sunday? Um, it's kind of a question, too. I, I appreciated this study, and it reminds me of when Jesus when Jesus was on the cross and they pierced him and blood and water came out of him. Yes. And to me, that's, it's such a picture here because yes, you need, you need repentance, but uh, you have, that has to be with the grace of Jesus Christ and, and through his blood in order to actually be saved. Yes, absolutely. <sighs> Thanks, Sandy. Okay, Anybody that else? seems to be about it. Okay. I thank everyone for joining us. This was an experiment. Obviously, it's problematic to people from South Africa. It's, it's nearly 12.30 at night there. So, um, just before we go, any other questions before we all say goodnight then? Anyone else? Any, regardless of how silly you might think, if you're thinking it, somebody else is also thinking it. Okay. Okay. Bonsoir, Dome bien. Thank you so much for joining us. Bless you guys. Speak to you again soon. Take care. God bless. God bless. God bless. God bless, Jacob. God bless. God bless, God bless. God bless. God bless you all. God bless. God bless. For more information about Moriel, check out our website, www.moriel.org.